Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone. Good morning from the middle of North America. Thank you so much for joining me. So today we're going to talk about media literacy. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the plan today. So we're going to talk first of what media literacy actually is, why we need it, how do we do it, and what the latest research says. So I live in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm right in the center of North America. It is 5 a.m. here, and I am well caffeinated. We're very famous in St. Louis for baseball and Budweiser. Those are our two claims to fame, but no Budweiser this morning, just Diet Coke. So media literacy is the act of asking questions. It's the 21st century survival skill. I'm really lucky that I'm able to teach a freestanding media literacy course here at Webster. And what we do is encourage students to ask questions. Who is the sender of the message? What's their motive or intent? How is the message designed or created to get my attention? Who's the target market? What information is left out? Who profits from this message? And what would someone else think of this? So what we do is ask these questions constantly about all messages, about textbooks, about emails from the dean, about uh, speeches from the president, about Time Magazine, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, anyone that's giving us a message, we encourage students to ask these questions. I start every semester with this on the screen and I ask them, what is this? And people will say, students will say, it's a horse. And I want them to say, it's a picture of a horse because what we need to help them understand is that every media message they consume is a construction, is mediated, is the result of many decisions from many different people. So we want that awareness. So yes, this is a picture of a horse, not an actual horse. When I do media literacy workshops for younger teacher or teachers of younger kids here in the United States, Usually someone will say, well, I teach media literacy. We have Chromebooks in the classroom. And my response is, okay, a Chromebook in the classroom is educational technology, but media literacy is analyzing the messages that come through that technology. So let me show you what I mean. This student knows how to use a Chromebook but doesn't necessarily have media literacy skills to understand the messages that come through. And I love this example because it demonstrates how in our brains, we are automatically geared to think that whatever words are under someone's photo are their names. So one thing media literacy is not is media bashing. There are plenty of things to to complain about when it comes to the media, but that's not what we do. Uh, I had the hardest time explaining to my dad what I actually do for a living because he thought that I just taught kids to hate the media. And it's much deeper than that. So why do we need these skills? Why are media literacy skills so important in today's day and age? Well, this is the way that I ended up explaining it to my dad. These are pictures of older people in the society telling stories. And these stories can talk about what's important, what's valuable, uh, maybe how to hunt, how to stay alive, how to um, succeed, what it means to be successful, what it means to be attractive, what are the cultural stories, the heritage. So who tells our stories now? They tell our stories. 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 The difference here is that these entities are commercial operations. They don't necessarily have our best interests at heart. And I know that sounds cynical, but you know, I, I have a hard time explaining to my, my students that Instagram does not exist as a public service. It exists to make money for the stockholders. And that is 
I think one of the toughest things, like if we can help students understand the role they play in the economic structure of the media ecosystem, it helps them filter what they consume a little bit more because they understand why they are getting the messages they're getting. And the messages are everywhere, everywhere. So yes, standard newspapers, and of course, you know, the, the printed edition of newspapers aren't nearly as popular as they used to be. They show us a definition of the world in a format that is slightly outdated, but they define the world for us in situations where we can't be there ourselves. But the media do much more than that. They explain and define romance and love for us. I actually had a student do a presentation on how this movie ruined his life Apparently his girlfriend broke up with him because she said he wasn't as romantic as Noah from the notebook. And I told him I thought he dodged a bullet. But the idea here is that we are given unrealistic expectations in many cases. We are also taught what it means to be a man and what it means if you don't have this product. We are also taught um, how brides are supposed to look on their wedding day. They better not be a pound overweight. I love, you know, the first time I saw this ad, I was horrified because I thought it was so tacky and sexist. But from a media literacy point of view, this is genius because it, it captures a common fear and provides a very simple solution in a visually clever way. When my, son, when my son saw me complaining about this ad, he said, well, mom, he's trying to help her. <laughs> Media messages can also tell us that it's possible to love a product and have a product love us, that we're encouraged to have relationships with products. And in doing so, our real relationships with people are trivialized. Media messages can also teach us about people that we do not know in person. They help us define ourselves. And even more importantly, they help us define the other. So that if we have never met anyone that's different from ourselves, we are dependent on the commercially based media to teach us about those people. And that is an enormous responsibility they have. Media messages also tell us that it's most important how you look and that it's very easy to shill products on Instagram for $50,000 a pop. And even the formats or the platforms can teach us things. Um, TikTok, of course, is performance-based, right? But it also teaches us that nothing is worth paying attention to if it lasts longer than 15 seconds. I found out yesterday that 90% of my students are getting all of their news about what's happening in Ukraine from TikTok, uh, an unfiltered, unverified platform. So these critical thinking skills are more important than ever. And one of the biggest issues is the amount of misinformation that is online. And this has happened for a few reasons. Um, you know, when I was growing up, not everyone had access to media production. Not everyone had access to a screen. And now we all do on a very simple, tiny device. We can create anything that looks like it was created by the New York Times or CNN. Misinformation is all around us and it has been forever. Even Genghis Khan used misinformation to send troops ahead of his main army to tell the towns that the army was too big and that everyone was surrendering. The only issue now is that we can create it ourselves and it travels at the speed of light. It's virtually impossible to detect in many cases. So bots and fake accounts are very active in this sphere. The Atlantic says that 
52% of Twitter accounts are actually bots, which I think is fascinating. So there's, and you know, we've all read the articles about how the information warfare is such a big deal, but this is one of my favorite examples. This is from our 2016 election here in the United States. And if we go through the questions, the media literacy questions, who's the sender of the message? Well, what's really difficult with messages now is that you might know who the sender is if you see it on a platform, but we don't know who originated the message. We don't know the provenance of that message. So here, this is created to look very legitimate. And it says, uh, it's critical we get out the vote this year to defeat Donald Trump. That's why we fought for and won the battle for online voting. Now, I have no doubt that many people thought that if they just posted Hillary on Twitter during the election, that that counted as a vote. But she did not win Pennsylvania. And I'd love someday to figure out what, if any, role this may have played. It's genius. It's like Bond villain level genius, because I'm sure some people fell for this. And one of the other reasons that misinformation is such a big deal now is that we don't trust our mainstream media sources the way that we used to. And we're very sheltered in, um, in our socioeconomic bubbles, especially online, where we tend to think, feel, believe, and vote the way that other people do in our little bubbles. Now, this is a really interesting case and it's old, but I, I wanted to show it to you because this is one that wasn't actually created fake. This was when the Associated Press Twitter account was actually hacked by a group of Syrians. But the important issue here is that the stock market dropped considerably after this came up. And we didn't do enough lateral reading, which I'll get to in a second. And there's a lot of misinformation flying around about what's going on in Ukraine. We have to remember that it's very easy to take old photos or old videos and recycle them and repurpose them and reframe them for whatever's happening that moment. And we also want to help the students understand the terms that are used. Word choice is very important. And because every media message is a construction, decisions have been made about what words to use. So one of the activities we do in class is I will give them a famous news photo, um, like say from the D-Day landings in 1944. So from a, uh, from a Nazi perspective, we were invaders. From a French perspective, the Americans were liberators. It all depends on the word choice, right? Word choices are very important. So this is a chart that shows uh, the adults who believe fake news is a major problem in the United States by political affiliation. Um, and I, this was the only chart that I could find. I couldn't find one that was global, but I have a feeling that um, misinformation and especially online misinformation is a concern for all people, especially educators. So over half, think that fake news is a major problem. And then here's worldwide adults who believe fake news is prevalent in selected media. Now, what's tougher here is that the online news websites and platforms um, can easily be hacked. And like I mentioned earlier, travel at the speed of light. This is what makes me a little bit nervous. Level of trust and here it shows that worldwide, we trust search engines more than traditional media. And that concerned me for a couple of reasons, because I don't think our students recognize that if they are doing a Google search, sitting next to someone doing the exact same Google search, that their results are gonna be different based on the cookies and the algorithms on their devices. You know, maybe they don't know that in order to do business in their country, Google has like written agreements with 27 different countries that in order to do business, they will censor search results. Do we really understand how important it is for a company or a site to be at the top of a Google page and how they can make that happen with algorithms and just paying Google for that ability? So 
it feels like we almost have too much trust in search engines and not enough trust in media outlets that actually have editors and people who verify information. So here's what we know about misinformation. Um, it's not new, it's been around forever. There's very little risk involved for the platforms. Um, they are not legally responsible for anything posted on them by a third party. It's most effective when it's emotional. If you see something that you think uh, really winds you up, makes you really angry, really scared, really sad, that's usually a first clue that you should check it out. Um, it fills a vacuum because we're not consuming traditional media the way we used to. It usually claims to be the only source of truth. Also, another clue is that it usually uses a lot of capital letters and punctuation. Um, it's typically created for a specific audience. It reinforces beliefs. It doesn't necessarily change anybody's mind. And if you include a little few details, it'll make it more believable. But one of the biggest issues with media in general is the, con the amount that we are consuming. So right now, Americans are consuming 11 plus hours a day. And we're, the, like, we're in the middle. Um, countries in the Pacific region consume a lot more than we do, a lot more than Americans do. So we don't say in the media literacy world that the media are bad. We say, if we are spending this much time with something, why aren't we talking about it more than we do? We don't talk about it. And one of the biggest problems is that people don't think that it affects them. This is called the third person effect. And I like to create memes. So these are the memes that I show. These are the memes that I show my students. A couple of years ago, a survey was done where they asked, do the media affect society? And 80% of the respondents said, yes, it affects society. Then they changed the words. Do the media affect you? personally, and only 12% said yes. So we don't think it affects us, but we're spending 11 hours a day with it. I put memes in my syllabi. In the, in the constant attempt to get students to actually read a syllabus, I put memes in. Uh, I also like this one too. And I'd be happy to share any of these. If any of you would like some of these memes, just email me and I'll be sure to send them to you. So how do we do this? How do we help students critically consume all of the media that they see? Well, I had this harebrained idea when I first started teaching that we were going to spend, my students and I were going to spend a weekend without any media at all. We were going to go on a media fast and we were gonna journal about it. And it was gonna be this bonding experience that my students and I had, because I had read that the only way to really teach a fish that water exists is to take it out of the water, right? So we were gonna have this fabulous bonding experience by doing a media fast. And you're laughing right now because you know how that turned out. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> it was a disaster. I cheated, they cheated, everybody cheated. And it wasn't necessarily cheating deliberately, but there's nowhere one can go without being exposed to some sort of electronic media. And plus we have this, um, it, it's called a smart tick, where we feel like every single waking moment needs to be consumed with some sort of piece of information. Um, if you're like me, you've noticed how before class students used to talk to each other and now they just, sit on their phones in a silent room. Yeah, it's, um, it's a real challenge. So if you want to start teaching media literacy, don't do this activity. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So how do we do it? Well, every class period, we examine a particular media message. And I'm going to go through these again, because I love them so much. Who's the sender? What's their motive? How is it designed? Who's the target market? What information is left out? That's one of my favorites along with this one, who profits from this message? And what would someone else think of this? These are the standard media literacy questions. So it, it reiterates the fact that we're not complaining about the media, we're, we're simply questioning it. And what it does is it creates more of an active relationship with the media rather than a passive one. So instead of just passively consuming information, we're encouraging students 
to be more active and asking questions about what they're consuming. So here are some ways to spot some misinformation, for example. Check your emotional response, slow down, look for sender and originator. Remember that breaking news brings out the fakers and the photoshoppers, and it's really easy to recycle, repurpose, and reframe. So let's examine this tweet from a while ago. This is from Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Uh, this is Flood Shark. Flood Shark shows up quite a bit. I love Flood Shark. So uh, I actually showed this in class yesterday and I said, all right, let's pick this apart. What are our clues? And uh, the students were pretty savvy. If the water is deep enough for a shark, how is someone driving in it? And another student said, if it's a flood, the water is never that clear. Like, all right, yeah. But this is Hurricane Harvey. Here he is, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Florence. Flood shark shows up all the time. And there's some things in play here. Um, we call it performative sharing. It's the idea that people will share material as an act of performance, as, a, as an act of saying, look what I knew before you did. And it's, people don't check it for authenticity, especially if it's a political message and it verifies what they already think, feel, and believe. But in this case, it's, it's not nefarious. It's just, oh, look what I saw without even any critical thought. So flood shark shows up all the time. And one of my friends did this, that if, if you enhance the image, this is actually what flood shark looks like. I love it. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Atlantic says that 52% of Twitter accounts are actually bots. So I'm gonna go through some tips and tricks on how to spot those. Um, this was a recent follower I, I've got, his name is James. So some of the red flags here, there's no profile picture, there's no banner photo. His account is relatively new, but the biggest clue of all is the numbers after the name. If you have any new follower on Instagram or Twitter, and it's a name with a bunch of numbers afterwards, that is the biggest red flag of all. So this was a new follower that I got. And this was a really, interest, this was a really interesting example. Um, Austin Miller, okay, problems with the capitalization. There's Austin M. Look at all those numbers, red flag, red flag. He also says the website is u.sarmy.com. That is not the Army website. <clears throat> but also, I looked and I thought, you know, this my new boyfriend here, Austin Miller, <laughs> looks like a pretty well-decorated soldier. Um, I'm going to do a Google reverse image search of his photo. Well, it turns out that Austin Miller had like a big job with NATO. And so I have a YouTube channel where I debunk online misinformation and I walk people through how to do it. Okay. So I did a debunking video of Austin Miller's Twitter profile and I put it on my YouTube channel. Two women got into a fight in my YouTube comments saying that Austin Miller really loved them and not me. <laughs> so these work. These work really, really well, really well. Uh, something to watch out too, especially if you're American, um, many false accounts and bot accounts will present themselves as military because they know that we have a deep abiding love and respect for our military and we're more likely to um, respond to someone who claims to be in the military. It's a very interesting scam, very interesting scam. Speaking of military, this is my new Instagram boyfriend, Austin Jake, um, USA Army. That's another red flag because we call it the US Army. He loves to gym. <laughs> he doesn't have many posts. And that was the big clue for one of my sons who said, mom, if that was his real abs, he would have more than three posts. True enough. So. 
what's interesting to me is that a lot of my students are so um, interested in their number of followers, interested in affirmation from strangers, that they really don't have any critical thought when it comes to false accounts. And I think it's especially problematic for kids that are younger, younger teens, who don't have that critical lens yet and are just excited when people pay attention to them. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be fake accounts. Now, this came out um, right before the 2020 election, and it said, um, from Tehran this morning, graffiti says, thank you, Trump, source protected, red flag. Now, this account has a blue check mark, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that whatever is posted on this account is accurate. What it simply states is that Twitter has verified that that account is run by the person that claims to run the account. All right. So um, I had a friend here in the office tell me um, that that really did say, thank you, Trump. But the issue was, this is an old photo. If you do a Google reverse image search, you're going to see, whoops, you're going to see that this photo is actually from 2014. Okay. But she never checked it. And she actually was a senior Middle East correspondent for Fox and lost a ton of credibility because she's posting things that she didn't check herself. And this came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. I don't know if you were aware that the 5G phone signal caused the coronavirus, because of course, right? So this really grabbed my attention because of all of the hashtags. Um, actually, one of these hashtags is reference to QAnon, that conspiracy theory, saying that you know we're being fooled because the government is putting in 5G in all of these strange places. Well, I did a Google reverse image search of this, and this photo is actually from 2013. And then I did a deep dive on all the places that uh, phone signals are inserted. And yes, they're put in chimneys, they're put in pine trees, they're put in palm trees, they're put in water towers, church steeples, cacti, lots of places. So what this person did was find an old photo, slap a bunch of hashtags on there. And if you're following any of these hashtags, you're more likely to believe this and less, you know, less likely to check it for authenticity and off it goes. And this actually went viral last week saying that Odessa riot police had dumped the shield saying that they were protesting that the, the um, coronavirus restrictions or something. And actually this is from 2012. Now, videos are a little harder to verify because there's, there's not a Google video reverse image search. Um, Amnesty International has a really great site called the YouTube Data Viewer. And if you plug in the URL of a YouTube video, it will tell you where and when it was uploaded. And that kind of, that might give you an idea of how original or how valid the video is. Um, another thing you can do in this, because a lot of times, you know, the viral videos we see are on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter, or whatever. Uh, it's harder to do that because it's not a YouTube URL, right? So one thing that's been suggested, and I don't think it works as well, but watch the video, pause it, take a screenshot of that, and then do a Google reverse image search of that screenshot to see where else that video shows up. One of the things that we really encourage people to do is lateral reading. And that means uh, if you see something from one source, don't just take it from one source. See what other people are talking about. Like that, that meme about uh, online voting in Pennsylvania. You know, it would have taken three seconds to search Google and find out that there's no such thing as online voting in the United States. But lateral reading encourages us to look at other sources. So here's my example. March 27th, right after the, the, right after the pandemic started, this shows up on a Facebook page. Queen Elizabeth tests positive for coronavirus. Well, you know what? If the queen had really tested positive, mm, the BBC would be talking about it. CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, everybody would be talking about the queen having the coronavirus, which she did two years later. But if we see something that's just mentioned in a meme or a post, lateral reading is a way for us to verify that by checking to see if anybody else is 
actually talking about it. Yeah, so it actually turned out to be true. One of the biggest trends right now is called smishing. <clears throat> now, I know you're familiar with phishing, right? Is the, the scam emails. Well, they've gotten more sophisticated now and it's smishing, SMS phishing or like texting. Okay. My student, one of my students received this from a number that, that she had never seen. And she sent me the screenshot because she said, I, I don't know this person. And I thought that was kind of interesting because the night before, and I think I'm kind of savvy, right? No, I got fooled. Here's what happened. I get a text message and it says, um, like, hi, Kenny, this is Amy. We met on eHarmony and we never got to hook up because I had to go take care of my grandma, but I'm back in town. Do you want to meet up? And because I'm like this nice mom, I, re I replied, I'm so sorry. I've had this phone number for 20 years. I hope you find your friend. The response I got was, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just texted a random dude. <laughs> I am not a dude. I hope you find your friend. Good luck. Okay. Next thing I know, she sends me a photo. So what are you up to tonight? What do you think about the pandemic? So I'm like, ah, this is stupid. I deleted the chat. The next day I'm talking about it in class. One of my students had this texted to her, the exact same photo, the exact same photo. And so I put this photo on Twitter to say, has anybody else gotten a smish using this poor girl's photo? And like eight people responded that they had. I don't know where this photo came from, but this poor girl probably has no idea that she's a part of this bot campaign. But smishing is really effective because the act of texting is an intimate one, right? Most people don't text you unless they know you. And so it feels more intimate than an email. And that feeling of intimacy might make you more likely to respond. I mean, it, it did me, I was trying to help. It turned out I was being scammed and didn't realize it. So look, be on the lookout for smishing, make sure your students are aware of it. Another big thing that's happening is messages like this. Um, this came through on Facebook Messenger. And what's so interesting about this uh, I haven't spoken to Nancy in probably five or 10 years. And yet that hook, look who died. I mean, it's, you're more likely to click on it if it's from someone you know, and with a hook like that. So we have to have our little internal BS detectors activated all the time, all the time. Um, this is a QR code that will send you to a PDF list of tools with all sorts of links that I use for my digital forensics. Um, and I'm going to leave this up here for a minute or so so that you all, if you want, you can uh, take a picture of this QR code and it'll take you to the Google Doc with all the links on it. It's a PDF with hot links to all the tools. And I'm going to um, hopefully talk about digital forensics in a much more detail um, this summer. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Okay, I'm gonna leave this up for a second so you all can get there if you want to. All right, we're moving on. It's really, really important that we understand that everything is a construction. Um, the horse, reality shows, news programs, movies. I love the Great British Baking Show, and I was fascinated at why I loved it so much. And it turns out that even this is a construction. They're told to wear the same clothes two days in a row, and they're not allowed to open the oven unless a camera is on them. Fascinating. Um, we need to understand the commercial aspect of everything. And now that we are streaming, rather than watching broadcast TV, Product placement is more important and more relevant than ever. And we have to understand how effective it is. Um, 
In fact, I started watching a show on Netflix called Cobra Kai. It's totally cheesy, but there is a zoom of a Coors Light can every single episode. Yeah, we have to be aware. Uh, we also have to understand that editing plays an enormous role. Now, if uh, I'm completely obsessed with Formula One racing and Netflix's new version of Drive to Survive comes out on Friday, Max Verstappen, the current world champion, which someone don't, you know, some don't think he's a legitimate champion, watch the show to find out the drama. Um, he's boycotting it. He will not be interviewed by Netflix because he says they edit him to make him look however they want. And I'm like, Max, they edit everything to make everything look however they want, right? And we have to understand that history isn't necessarily taught through movies. It can be, but we have to understand that everything is a construction. And the reason, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not picking on Dunkirk. Dunkirk is one of my favorite, favorite war movies. But one of my son's history teachers used the, the Mel, Gibson um, Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, to teach about the American Revolution. And really, I think what a, what a more interesting activity would have been is to show that movie in class and then have the students determine what was real, what was authentic in that movie, and what was a construction. Like, was it historically accurate? This is what we are hoping the students would do right, is, oh, I really, I really enjoyed this. I want to see how much of it was accurate, that sort of thing. And there's even articles about the best camera angles for football. Like, the angles make a difference. The word choice makes a difference. The photo captions and the headline make a difference, especially because now we're really, what we're doing is called info snacking rather than reading entire articles. We, instead of having the whole meal, we just have the snack, which isn't necessarily bad, but in many cases, the headline does not match the article. And the photo captions can be easily manipulated by word choice. And there are a lot of decisions made in order to attract our subconscious sex appeal or our subconscious sexual desires. Nothing is accidental. There's a reason that this ad looks like a vagina. There's a reason, nothing is accidental. And you, know, um, you will hear a lot of people say, well, sex sells. Well, yeah, you know why? It's because that's the one thing that crosses over every single demographic group. If you are a human being, you are a sexual being. And that is one thing that will get your attention, especially because the latest research says most people now are seeing 5,000 ads a day. So if you wanna cut through that clutter, sex is a good way to do it. So speaking of constructions, look at how easy it is to make fakes. I spoke to the Catholic News Service last year through this tweet up there. Half the people thought it was real. <laughs> Julie, how did you get the Pope to tweet about you? I'm like, oh, come on. This was 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I would love to say that this is real. Sadly, it is not. It looks real though, doesn't it? It is so easy to create fake DMs, fake tweets, and there are a hundred websites that can help you do this. I did this in 20 seconds. Yeah, um, I wish it was real. But you don't have to be manipulated digitally. We can be manipulated in the old fashioned way. So this was a photo that came out of Syria a few years ago. And automatically, right, our brains tell us that this boy is sleeping in between the graves of his parents, right? We just feel it in our gut. Actually, his parents are alive. The, uh, the photographer just asked him to lay down there so he could take a photo. So it doesn't have to be digitally manipulated to still be manipulative. Um, we have to understand that most media decisions are commercial. Um, this is all time Hollywood box office worldwide. 
And what's so interesting about this list is that there is nothing on here that is an original idea. Everything is a franchise or based on a book or based on a comic book or a sequel. Um, you might say The Lion King is an original idea. I would say that it's Hamlet. Um, there's no risk. Hollywood is not going to spend a gazillion dollars unless they know they're going to get it back and you get it back with franchise films and sequels. You know, Star Wars Episode Seven. the, the reviews could have been absolutely terrible, but we would have all gone, right? There's no risk. It's a commercial decision. It's a commercial decision when we are advertised products that make us act like crazy people. Yeah. My favorite over here is the one that says, um, text your ex, maybe even go over. Okay. <laughs> Everything is a commercial decision. And I'm gonna pick on Mark Zuckerberg here for a minute. If you look at the world's most used social platforms, Mark Zuckerberg has four of the top five. Facebook, of course, owns WhatsApp and Instagram, and obviously Facebook Messenger. And YouTube, of course, is owned by Google. 500 hours of content are uploaded every minute to YouTube. YouTube streams more music than Apple, Spotify, and Pandora put together. So YouTube is a behemoth, but nothing can top Facebook and that is his net worth as of last week. Everything is a commercial decision. Which brings us to this. Uh, we have to help students understand that if they are using an app or a website for free, they are not the customer. They are the product being sold. So what does the research say about all this? You know, we can talk till the cows come home that media literacy is important, but does it work? I just have anecdotal evidence of uh, students who will reach out later and say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I don't consume the news the same way or I, et cetera, um, which makes me happy. But there is actually research saying that this works. That if students have media literacy education, they're less likely to believe fake news. If students have media literacy expectation, they're less likely to view the media as a reliable source of sexual education information. If students have media literacy education, they're less likely to fall for food ads for unhealthy foods. If students have media literacy education, they're less likely to have alcohol and drug abuse. If students have media literacy education, they're less likely to fall for cigarette ads and now especially vaping ads. If students have media literacy education, they're less likely to be victims online of cyberbullying and harassment and more likely to take control and their agency of their online profiles. And of course, this is from the National Association for Media Literacy Education Journal. So it's not objective, but it actually says that media literacy can help overall health for adolescents, not just physical based on fast food advertising, excuse me, but emotional health because it changes the relationship that they have with the media. UNESCO has actually claimed that media literacy education is a human right, which I think is fascinating. Um, they refer to media literacy as information literacy, and it's um, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. This is me when people finally realize that media literacy is important. <laughs> and I'm a big advocate of media literacy in every classroom regardless of what we teach. It is completely cross-curricular and so useful because it's relevant. Students are really anxious to talk about this stuff. And it's their world, it's their world. It is very engaging for them. So this is a QR code to my website. My email is heyjuliesmith at gmail.com.